Okay, here we are, ready to ready to haiku, haiku after a very. We were just talking about a, a very busy summer for everyone. You'd think summers would be, you know, summers would be um, time to relax and leisure, and and I don't think it's true of any of us, is it? Summer is mismarketed. <laughs> it is, yeah. I need I need the fall to give me a break from my summer. Yeah, exactly. Well, there's a lot of personal choice involved in that, I think, probably for most of us. Yeah, yeah. It's true. For sure. So let's haiku. What do you say? Oh yeah. It's good. Let me see if I can let me see if I can share my screen. Yes, I can. So here we go. And we've got uh, I think three great haikus. We've got Amy, Davin, and Michael. Who who would like to go first? Who do we want to go first? Is there a logical? Probably not a logical. I vote for Amy. You know, All right. I, always, I always vote for Amy, you know? <laughs> Start strong is what I say. That's right. Okay. I don't know about that. All right, my haiku this month was tree cathedral, eyes drawn upward to heaven, no need to strive be. And that's the picture that I took. I think all of these actually I took. Nice. It's always great. Yeah, great. always awesome when we can get our own photos in there. Yeah. Yeah, and these are so great, so perfect, perfect. Where where, where were they taken? Do you remember? That um, yeah, this is actually the bridge is where I walk every morning. It's along the creek in the end, far end of my neighborhood. Nice. Nice. Wonderful. Not on the yeah. green belt. It almost looks like a green belt picture. It's not. Yeah, it does look like a green belt picture, but it's not. It's on Dry Creek. <laughs> Do you live on Dry Creek? Yeah. Yeah. Oh wow! I love Dry Creek. It's a great yeah. hiking spot. It anyway, um, who wants to go first, Avenue or me? Sure. Or? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to to go first. Perfecto. So much of my work revolves around effort, determination, and discipline. Working with returning adult students, pursuing graduate degrees requires this mindset. There are so many additional distractions in their lives, burdens, responsibilities, competing obligations. For this particular population, the emphasis on that kind of structure and discipline is really important and necessary. And it bleeds into other areas of my life as well. I just listened to a homily, a sermon, uh, it was shared with me um, by a good friend. Um, if you know Father Mike Schmitz, he's not the good friend. He's the one who did the, the sermon. So he's got some internet notoriety. A Catholic priest does some good work. Delivered this past, past weekend. The title is You Must Fight for Heaven. Hmm. And it makes a similar argument for an effortful approach to our relationship with God. And it resonates with me. The danger of a one-dimensional perspective is, re is really very real though. Backsliding into the hubris of self-reliance, ignoring our deep dependencies on other people, communities, on God. <clears throat> I think trees more than anything else capture the beauty of a fuller, more realistic perspective. The eyes are drawn up to the treetops. I don't look up, my eyes are drawn upwards. There's a difference. I'm not the agent. And that's a rare, beautiful thing. It's meditative, it's quiet, it's receptive. It represents this deep other side of our work as humans, being open to the beauty and righteousness that is right in front of us every minute of every day and being thankful for it. So thank you, Amy. Mm -hmm. That was beautiful. Nice. I love, I love where you went with that. Thank you. Yeah, me too. It's a struggle for me. For Being, all of us. <laughs> no. Oh yeah. I'm not the one in charge here. Yeah. Okay. I love the idea of a tree cathedral. When one is in one, it's just so easy to sense the majesty, the holiness of a cathedral building. But this is a living cathedral. 
a natural, supernatural place. The easy glance of the trunk of a tree that just keeps climbing and climbing and climbing, the branches branching, lifting our imagination toward the skies beyond. Look up, she exhorts us. Look up, look up. Don't look down. Look, look, look up. There's no need to strive, to push, to strain ourselves to look up. Our eyes are drawn, 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 just like Davin was talking about, drawn upward to the sky, to the universe, to heaven. <clears throat> Excuse me. Just imagining myself on the bridge, ready to step forward with the strength and grace of these trees, these life-giving, strife-forbidding trees, slows my heart, deepens my breath, and I feel surrounded by the invisible mycelia of the spirit. Mm. Wow. <laughs> Boy, working my mycelia. <laughs> Working my cilia into that is yes, that's impressive. So <laughs> I, I love I love the way um, the the nouns become verbs, Michael. This is a pattern, you know, in in your writing. Branches branching. Um, <laughs> it, it's uh, it's a lot of fun. I love how you both focused on drawn up. That's so so interesting. It's a great word. Um, it wasn't until I became an Episcopalian several years ago that I understood what a cathedral was. Cathre cathedral is the seat of the bishop or the principal church in the diocese. A cathedral is a little bit fancier church with a little uh, with a few more stained windows. The ceiling soar just a little higher. The fl floors are waxed and polished just a rub more. As much as I love Sunday worship in our cathedral with historic stained glass windows, a Tiffany window shipped around South America in Boise, Idaho, I have found myself pausing on my morning walks, gazing upward and upward still, thinking those stained gla glass windows are beautiful, but they can't compete with these elegant, soaring cottonwood trees. Daily, the trees remind me to look up, look up higher still. They whisper, we don't try, we just sway. Cathedrals are made, but they are created too. The trees reach high, they dance in the wind, they root down and connect through the interwood web. In a tree cathedral, there is no need to strive. We can indeed just be. Uh, reminds me of the, the book, I think you recommended to us, Amy, about the, the incredible ecosystem underground you know with trees who's the author of that uh peter uh wilheimer or will it's um a book about the tr tree speak or yeah. it's such a good book yes yeah very cool if any uh, cathedral can compete with trees it's the one you go to <laughs> i know it's so beautiful it is it is just it's uh, saint michael's Mm -hmm. Michael's uh, Episcopalian right here in yep. Yep. Boise. Downtown Boise, um, yeah. So that's that's beautiful. I think I've been lost there before. <laughs> What's that? I said I think I've been lost there before. I'm not sure <laughs> <where> I'm going. <laughs> it's gorgeous, you know, and I don't get there. We have a beautiful ch church too. It's called the Cathedral of the Rockies uh, Methodist, but it's not the seat. It, that's just a, I think it's just a, someone dubbed it that because our bishop doesn't reside there, but that's, you know, that is the definition, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, it's a beautiful church too. So let me see if I can share screens again. Yes, I can. Isn't that pretty? I just think that's really pretty. And I'm not sure what this color is, but I like this. Is it blue, light blue? Yeah, blue? yeah. It's gorgeous. Like a, a Tiffany blue or a Columbia yeah. blue, Tar Heel yeah. blue. <laughs> Nice. That's right. Nice, That's nice. right. Davin, you want to go next or me? You sure. Pick? I'll go next. Look at that. Oh, sweet. Yeah. Did you take that picture? I was just going to say, I wish I could say I had taken it, but that's a, that's a Canva original. So, nice. um, but it's, it's perfect. They've got a whole series of photos of, of these, um, of that, you know, happening. Yeah. It's just, really really fun and cool so cute yeah and um 
are there other pictures there, Michael? Yes. Are you able to yes, 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 other yes. Pictures yep, there? I got them. All right. Excellent. So that's a that's a black walnut tree. Um, mm -hmm. And so barn swallows are, are really, I love barn swallows um, and black walnut trees. The wood on black walnut trees is beautiful, but it's the first tree to lose their leaves at the end of summer. So black walnut trees are dropping their leaves right now. So it's really this harbinger of the, the change in seasons. Um, and don't get caught underneath some of those black walnuts because when they drop, man, they, they drop. <laughs> and barn swallows are um, this, those birds that if you ever watch, um, I, I'm sure they'd have them in barn swallows in Boise as well. If you watch like a, at a football field and somebody's mowing the grass on a football field, barn swallows will fly over because they're catching the bugs that are, that are kicked up and they just fly beautifully and they're beautiful birds too. Mm -hmm. So are All there right. birds in this picture? Not in that picture, no. That's just the black walnut tree and then the barn swallows up above. Oh, up above. Up yeah. above. I was going to say, I see like nuts on the right-hand side, but I don't but I don't see any birds. Nice. You scroll up, scroll, scroll up to the poem. Thank you. All right. I see those. All right, so I called it the unraveling. Summer unravels. Morning bird chorus has fledged. Soon the leaves will fall. Yeah. Probably more appropriate for our August time frame than when I wrote it in in July, but um, but it, it works nonetheless. Yes, it's it good. does. Look at it's those birds; time. they're hungry. <laughs> they're so good. They're so good. Okay. Do you want to go, you Michael? Want to go first or second? You go. Just, me go. I'll go second. Yeah, you go. I like to stay till last and let all oh. the brilliance come out before me. And then I'm just gonna shine it up a That's my play too. <laughs> <laughs> Did you know that raveling and unraveling mean the same thing? I didn't until I read this haiku. Did you know what fledged meant? I didn't, though I thought I knew what full-fledged meant. These are the little tidbits one picks up when reading a haiku from Davin or Amy. I did not know a bird chorus could fledge, and I like that it does, all full feathered chirps. I also had not ever imagined a summer unraveling. I can imagine any excuse for staying out for another beer unraveling under my wife's threadbare glower. Just kidding, honey. Uh, artistic license. I've, I've never actually seen you glower. Um, I can imagine a 6-2 lead at the bottom of the ninth unraveling, perhaps, being ripped apart. But summer? And yet it does, doesn't it? Of all the seasons, summer is the most put together. The most, at least before these ridiculously, irresponsibly, human-enabled, caused, and mad swings of the climate, Seamless, most stitched together of the four, only to pull apart each shortening day as it rends itself into the patchwork of fall. Leaves will fall soon, Davin notes, and yet the nest of our warblers is comprised of leaves that have already fallen, branches that have been cobbled together from an earlier day. And so the repurposing of our lives and deaths and births and songs of hunger and needs burst forth. It's so good. Nice. Thank you. All right. I've dabbled in knitting on and off over the years. Any knitter knows something about unraveling. I can be clicking along, lost in the rhythm of it. When I pause, my heart sinks, and I realize five rows back, I dropped a stitch, and there is a weird gaping hole. I pull the string and see stitch after stitch unfurl. It unravels much quicker than it took to create. When I read Summer Unravels, I felt a visceral sense of recognition. Yes, there is a moment right about now in late July or August when summer starts to unravel. The heat and sun of the summer start to take their toll on the plants and grass. Everything starts to dry out, wilt, and fade. Where there used to be excitement and eagerness um, over overgrowth and sunshine starts to shift to a longing for just a little bit cooler days. Summer has started to unravel. 
parents start wondering just how many days it is until school starts. One of the things I love about living in Idaho is we have the full expression of every season. Hot summer days with lots of sunshine, we do that here. Fall colors, pumpkins, and harvest, we have that. Snowstorms, frigid weather, and skiing, we have some of the best. Spring, we've got that too. There's a point in each season when it has reached its zenith and the unraveling inevitably comes. Mm -hmm. I've never thought about seasons unraveling, but I sort of love it. That's great. Yeah, yeah, and summer does. Summer does unravel. <laughs> it, does. it was such a great word. I had never ever put unravel in a season. And once I once I read it, I was like, oh my gosh, that's so insightful. And then it hits the the wall of fall. Yeah. <laughs> so all right, I live I live in the Miami Valley. It's a large section of the Midwestern United States formed by the Great Miami River and four other rivers that eventually flow into the Ohio River near Cincinnati. <clears throat> Bill Felker, he's a local celebrity, a treasure really from Yellow Springs, Ohio. He writes something called Poor Will's Almanac, mm -hmm. modeled on the Farmer's Almanac. And he offers short weekly monologues on our local NPR station, WYSO, YSO. He writes mostly about the patterns and rhythms of nature and weather that shape our lives. His writing provided this image of summer's ending. Everything kind of unravels. It's not a clean or sharp demarcation between summer and fall, but rather a paradoxical movement forward through processes of disintegration. The leaves fall, the once full nests of baby birds go empty, Days get painfully shorter and mornings become blissfully cooler. But for me, it's the dramatic shift in the sounds of the morning that mark the change more than anything else. Spring and most of summer bring an amazing chorus of bird song beginning at daybreak as birds start to mark their territory and trying to attract potential partners and mates. But once the nests are empty, and the babies have taken flight, mornings become dramatically quieter. The unraveling has begun and fall is on the horizon. So I love it. But it's, it's like, you know, late July here in this part of the country, all of a sudden 5 a.m., it just, the birds are, they're not quiet, but it, it's a cacophony until then. And then it's just, it's like a switch one day, you know? No need to mark territory or or find a mate anymore. That that's done for the year. So, Amy, you're the only one amongst us that hasn't experienced an empty nest yet. That's right. <laughs> it's a it's a it's an interesting unraveling and re-raveling, I guess. Can you re-ravel? You can't re-ravel. Re, 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 <laughs> unraveling and stitching together, re-stitching. Yeah, re-stitching. Yeah. All right, I, love I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love those bird mouse. You know, it's great. And why so? What a great NPR channel name. Why so? It is. It's a great station. <laughs> okay. Onward, last and perhaps least. Okay. These were um, all of your photos. Yeah, these 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 are a little more out of focus than I wish they could be, but at least, you know, you know, I, I take these every day, you know, one or two or three, almost every day, just because, you know, I love getting out with taking a walk with my dogs. So here's pictures. They're all at one pond where our dogs, Tinkerbell and Shelby, join me, or actually they coerce me to go every morning. Uh, and these are pictures, and these were taken a little closer to spring, or a little closer to early summer when there were new babies and and uh, uh, little chicks, or a little I'm not sure what little birds are called, but and the same thing here. You can you, you might be able to see these little birds. They're out mm -hmm. far away from the what's it's goslings, right? Are those goslings? Goslings. Yeah. Goslings. Goslings. Ducklings. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. I tell you what, my dogs can kind of chase chase the birds during all the year, but when they have these little ones, man, I'm telling you what, our dogs <laughs> <laughs> have to back off. Right. <laughs> Geese can can be aggressive. We have a lot of geese around here along the river, and um, you know, riding my bike along the river, they they don't take to it very kindly. No, 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 no. <clears throat> they kind of drop their head and put their wings up, and they'll hiss. So here we go. Um, and I think uh, I'm off a syllable maybe in this first one, but I can't. I I noticed that later. So here's the caregivers who sacrifice their lives for those holding them so close, lifting others up. We thank you, thank you. You matter so very much. The world's in your debt. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. You wanna go, Davin? My dogs just started barking, so okay. I'll, defer, oh, I'll no. defer to you until they stop. <laughs> okay, okay. Those mama ducks and geese. It's not late spring or early summer season without a few moments of slamming on my car brakes to let a mama and her brood cross the street. Mama duck has some caregiving lessons to teach, I think. Number mm -hmm. one. It's best to walk in a line. I never see ducklings or goslings strolling with mama out of line. Together we move. I'll follow her, I'll follow her, you follow me. Baby quails run in haphazard circle, circles, but goslings and ducklings move in formation. And who doesn't slam on their brakes, slow down, or maybe even bow their heads at an orderly line? Two, be bold. Mama ducks and geese astound me with their boldness. On the four-lane highway that she needs to cross, she will set out with her neck held high, her beak forward, and an energy about her that says, my babes and I are here. Stop now, for heaven's sakes. People stop. Her boldness requires it. Take naps when needed. This spring, I saw a mama and her babies resting in the middle of a road. I'm sure it was a cozy place to rest, but I'm not sure it was the safest place, but everyone slowed down and let them take their rest. And number four, respect my space and I'll respect yours. Mama ducks are happy to let interlopers watch, just don't get too close. Babies grow so fast. It's just a few short weeks of watching the birds raise their young. What lessons they do teach us in caregiving. Their attention is focused and pure. I love that. I just love that. That's, that's great. Yeah, the, the whole nap in the road thing. <laughs> it's a, a sort of asking to have your <laughs> DNA removed from the gene pool, I think. I know. I was like, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, Amy. Mm -hmm. So caregiving is the most important thing I've done in my life. I really appreciate that Michael's haiku images portray mother and father ducks and geese. Caregiving has a strong connotation of something we do for those nearing the end of life. While parenting, maybe because it is many things in addition to caregiving, seems to escape the category. But parenting is caregiving. My best moments as a father have been inspired by the idea of caregiving. And I've been rescued from my worst moments as a father by remembering what caregivers should do and be. I'm not sure what adulthood and psychosocial maturity would have looked like for me without that moment at age 27, realizing that two other brand new beings in the world depended entirely for me on everything. It was a very difficult delivery, and for two days, Allie, my wife, was near death. Loving her and caring for her suddenly shared space with these two helpless, beautiful boys, driving home the reality that if I didn't care for them, they wouldn't survive. And if I didn't do it well, they wouldn't flourish. Nothing has ever been as humbling or scary. Nothing can reorient the universe away from yourself to others as effectively. If I didn't take life seriously after that moment, I never would. Caregivers take life seriously, recognizing that things don't revolve around them. 
that there is a bigger picture and that the best things in life come when we serve others, putting their interests ahead of our own. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Part of that comes from, uh, some of that comes from a research project that Michael and I are actually doing about end of life caregivers as well. So <clears throat> there's your ghost, Michael. The door opens mysteriously. Dogs everywhere. Oh, you're muted. You're muted. Yeah, and da Davin, you're such an awesome caregiver. What a great dad you are. Husband, son. Best thing I've ever done. Mm. I don't know. I think your head protected the basement from nails and stuff this morning. <laughs> that was pretty heroic. <laughs> man walks into a bar <laughs> man walks into a bar oh gosh okay i wrote this haiku before i found the pictures to go with the card each of the pictures no surprise were taken at the pond in the park where the dogs and i take a walk every morning i looked at all the caregivers in this case moms and dads taking care of their little ones at the pond and it felt as if this haiku was written for them. When I raise my gaze from the birds, I can also see a mom riding a bike with her young child and two dogs, grandpa fishing with his grandson. I'm not sure who's the caregiver here uh, and, and the care receiver, and an older sibling overseeing a younger one on the playground equipment. But it wasn't written, this haiku, specifically for those caring for others at our little park. Actually, I've been thinking a lot about caregivers these days, partly because of, as Davin just mentioned a second ago, an end of life caregiving study that Davin and I have been working on with some of our students for the last couple of years. years. Partly because my daughter Piper, who has a beautiful boy, Grayson, who needs her 24 seven care, her focused attention, her own mama's caregiving, and how demanding that is. And partly because of all that, I find myself more open to, more aware of, and more grateful for these heroes who care for others, especially other people, especially other people, but also other animals, other living creatures, plants, and beautiful gifts of creation. At a time when so many public figures we observe seem so self-centered, so selfish, and so self-aggrandizing at the expense of others, it's rewarding to watch and to reflect upon the caregivers who sacrifice their lives for others. Thank you and thank you and thank you, caregivers of the world. Mm. Nice. Thank you for the haiku, Michael. Yeah, that was beautiful. So Amy, uh, you've, you've, you've been a third party listening to this, but this caregiving study, which Davin, it was D Davin's vision and he's led this project it has been just extremely meaningful uh, wow. for all of us. But I know it <laughs> definitely for, for me, it's just um, pretty, pretty, pretty darn me, pretty darn meaningful, you know? <laughs> yeah, amazing people. In a world of superficiality, we've got some serious, profound depth. Okay, anything else for the good of the cause? Just thank you to, to both of you for sticking with it over the summer here. It's great to, to come back together. I can Absolutely. feel my day unraveling. I can feel my day raveling even as we speak. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you all. See you next month. Yeah, thank you.